Hello and welcome, heroes, to the Crit Academy. I am your host, Justin. I'm your co-host, Ian. Oh, is that me? <laughs> That's you. <laughs> oh. And we hope we we hope to inspire you with creative content that can bring you that you can bring with you on your next adventure. Wow, that dyslexia. Hey, Alex, do you want to tell them who you are? <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm Alex Baum, and I am uh, a regular at this point. <laughs> I am a D and uh, D content creator. I do TikTok, where I do mostly things focused on dungeon mastering and um, you know helping you get more creative. And then on Twitch, we just uh, we just hang around and uh, uh, hang out and talk about D and D. Uh, today, uh, right after this, I'm going to be live, and I will be doing. Um, we're going to be making uh, D and D K pop stars. Ooh, that sounds cool. Yeah, so that's gonna be fun. Judging by was, I did not expe expect that. <laughs> um, so I think it would be a good time to let everyone know if you love D and D actual plays. Alex just had a very successful episode one of her baby initiative and intrigue. Do you want to tell everyone about it? Yeah, so Initiative and Intrigue is uh, my child, my show, my wonderful thing. Um, it is a interactive Dungeons and Dragons show that Justin is actually one of the players for. And um, what we do is uh, we're going on a, a very interesting quest where the uh, we are delivering a gift from the God of Death to the God of Revenge. Uh, currently, that is the quest that we are on right now. That's the, the starting quest. And um, how the um, how the audience members are like coming on the show and, and being a part of the show and the interactive part yes. is that you are collecting candles. And the reason why you were collecting candles is because you are working for a cult called the Black Rose Society. And the headmaster Jensen needs candles in order to complete the ritual, the awakening. And whenever you complete the awakening, the god of death and the god of the revenge will fuse and you will reunify into the god of death and revenge, Umbra Daituis, who almost destroyed the world last time they were alive. So Yes, it's so um, awesome. Your job is to destroy destroy the world. So uh, I'm going to post a link in uh, the Twitch chat. That is where uh, tomorrow at 6 a.m. Uh, Central Time, the uh, first episode is the first VOD is going to go up on that uh, YouTube channel. And um, yeah, I really hope you watch it and enjoy and come to the next live show. Yes, it was pretty hardcore. I loved it. <laughs> yes, it was. Knights board, board, which, uh, board, which, if I'm not mistaken, is Game Master Craig says most metal D&D yeah. &D game on Twitch. He's not wrong. Uh, so anyways, yes. Yeah, so thank you for joining us. Uh, our boy Austin is doing the boyfriendly duties and trying to repair his, uh, his girlfriend's vehicle. So um, he was not able to join us. And Alex has humbly... Uh, offered to uh be fill in whenever we needed it so guess what i did i reached out and she was happy to join so thank you for joining us uh i am really excited for today's episode you guys we want to thank you for joining us here at crit academy studios where everything's made up and your roles don't matter this is my part yeah, too. That, that's right your roles like it. armor with a poor upgrade yeah very good so one of my favorite things about certain MMOs is when I upgrade, uh, you put all, you gather all these really cool resources and you put them together and then you fail. Doesn't that suck? That's how I feel. Yeah. So fortunately, this uh, awesome supplement we're covering today uh, will make your upgrades not complete utter failures like some of mine. But before we get into all that, we I'd like to take a minute to uh, let everyone know our Capes and Crooks playtest streams are bi-weekly. Uh, one is coming up this Friday on the uh, 28th, um, so please come and join us. I'm thinking it might be the climactic uh, scene. We'll see how, depending on the player's choices, right? But I'm super excited for that. Uh, I do have a post dropping tomorrow for our Capes and Crooks uh, dev speak where I talk a little bit about my evolving powers and how I try to make my D&D &D 5e more super. So make, keep an eye out for that. 
We also like to give away fat loots on every single episode. Today we're giving away uh, feats. Don't fail me now. Does your fighter have a heart of fur? Is there more to your Warforge than meets the eye? Uh, I see what he did there. Does your rogue think dual wielding is for chumps? Then this is the D&D supplement for you, my friend. Feats Don't Fail Me Now is a collection of the greatest feats ever created for your not entirely serious D&D game. Over 40 feats for 5e. They're balanced, too. They think. Because, you know, breaking the game isn't no fun. Wink, wink. Anyways, it's a really cool uh, prize, and our winner today is Nonstop Disco 74. Woo! Can I give your name? It's like a big username. <laughs> I love it. Congratulations if you didn't win. Have no fear. You can head on over to CritAcademy.com and subscribe for your chance to win. That's all we do. Ask you to subscribe. That's it. And enter get week. Every week, we're giving away two new things. So... But let's get to the meat and potatoes of the episode. Today we are talking our main topic, the Complete Armorer's Handbook. If you don't know, this supplement provides a complete framework for putting your heroes in charge of their equipment selection and progression, offering competitive narrative opportunities, and introducing a much-needed structure, a much-needed gold sink, <laughs> like much needed gold sink uh, yes. into the fifth edition without reverting to magic item shops or adversely affecting game balance. So basically what it comes down to, it's a plug and play framework that just only benefits your game, right? Especially if you like to give your players agency um, and they like to, they have like to have foresight and kind of some ideas of what they, what direction they want to take in their equipment progression. It really makes getting new equipment and progressing it as fun as the, leveling up process on its own um what i really like about it it has a narrative investment in the equipment by offering an alternate alternative to replacement um as an upgrade path which is pretty cool because that's more story driven if you like that sort of stuff and it's fun and interactive money sink which is hard usually is not something that goes away at least as far as i've been alive anything i sink my money isn't always necessarily uh fun uh, uh my mortgage wasn't that yeah. wasn't fun um my bills, rent right just not good my car insurance <laughs> my car loan but the coolest thing is it reduces decision making overhead for the dungeon master which is so surprising because you would think something like this would really just require a whole hell of a lot more work and in actuality it really doesn't um, so you guys had a, a chance. I know Alex had a little bit less of a chance to skim through it, but overall, before we get into the nitty gritty, uh, is there, uh, what are your overall thoughts of what you did get through and, and kind of the idea behind this concept to begin with? To be honest, I'm really, really, really salty that you didn't put in a, a section for the different, um, materials. Yeah. So I just want to let everyone know that there's a section in this book where it talks about adamantian, cold iron, uh, dragon hide, mithril, all of these different uh, materials that you can make. And that yes. actually gives you the cool things that they can do. Like, it, like whenever they say that this book takes a lot of guessing out of the DM's work, mm -hmm. You don't. You think that adding it in, it wouldn't, but actually, it absolutely does because everything is laid out for you. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of like, oh great, what does cold iron do? I have no idea what cold iron is. It says right there, and it says what it does, and I just, I love that. Everything is well <laughs> laid out in this book. It's really, really good. Yeah, um, it is worth noting that the notes we don't necessarily have to abide by those. Those are mostly just a guide. So we will touch okay. on that if you're because you're so emotionally invested. Oh, yeah, yeah. We will touch more on that. Ian, what about you? <laughs> you know me, I've said numerous times that compared to pre editions, uh, fifth has been very short when it comes to equipment, especially customized equipment, or the rules to make your own. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't always solve it, but I do believe it gives you enough to give you a starting point to go off of. <laughs> Yeah, the one thing that I really thought was interesting is they, they right off the get, they're, they're like, hey, you're going to need more stuff, so we're going to replace the entire armor table found in the, the handbook. Um, they're referenced in brackets when they're used, but for the most part, they gave you um, new names. And I think uh, that has more to do with the way the upgrading system works. Um, and honestly, it just sounds cooler. Uh, like, you, instead of a breastplate, it's a hauberk, which is more, you know, accurate in my opinion. But most of the features and stuff are exactly the same as far as I could tell. I don't know if you guys noticed anything different. 
I think those uh, are the more historically accurate names yeah. if we're being real here. So, And for those that are watching, you can see I do have the PDF open, and I'm, I'm kind of scrolling through it as we we kind of touch on some of the the particular details. Um, if you have any questions in the, uh, in the chat that you would like to know about how it works or how it functions, please let us know. Um, if I don't know the answer right offhand, one of us will scroll through and find it. Um, do you guys have the PDF open uh, as we go through this as well? Okay. Yep. So uh, what so what are some of the options? Obviously, the most important one is the upgrading. There are a number of options available to a character to upgrade their armor from high-cost armor proofing to useful additions like insulation suitable for cold weather environments. That's something that, once again, unless your DM actively takes... Uh, uh, takes an approach to include the environmental effects, those get easily overlooked. So allowing and, and, and reinforcing that that stuff is important um, comes across in this supplement, I think, pretty well. Um, I don't know if there's um, anything, uh, any, if you guys have ever run into that issue where everyone's just like, oh, we don't worry about cold weather stuff. We just assume it's cold and we make checks and we move on, right? You guys had that like experience? Surprisingly, I have had the experience where like nice. I had DMs that completely uh, ignore cold altogether. And uh, I actually really dislike that. So I like the fact that, you know, this this almost gives the DM an excuse. Like, because sometimes you're like, ooh, do I really want to do that? Like, put that restraint on them because they're already right. through so many restraints. This gives the excuse of like, ooh, now if I put that restraint on them, they have more incentive to spend more of their gold that they have hoarding and you know i really like it <laughs> absolutely were you gonna say something uh, oh i just chuckled just because like well if you really want to be technical winter gear is already present and i'll admit i'm one of those people who who is a fan of not really taking into account all the extra environmental effects just because like yeah just from the standpoint of there's already a lot going on and i have been i think part of it though comes from the fact that i've been played some games or some D where the uh, GM tried to make things like uber realistic and that end up being one of the most not fun games I've ever hey, played. Yeah, no, um, that does happen sometimes. But as in like they were, as in she has this like draw a diagram of where our gear is in our backpacks. <laughs> okay, that's sad. Uh... Um, no, <laughs> my bag of holding is huge. Sorry, <laughs> I ain't got time for that. It's not, it's neatly organized is all you need to know. Um, so I can understand that that sort of thing. So what I want to talk about first is armor proofing and. Basically, what that means is you can have armor and equipment worked in such a way that it's more resistant to specific things, whether that thing is arrows, war hammers, um, uh, mauls, you know, slashing weapons in general. Um, so there's there's different uh, proofings you can do. And I think that that's uh, worth noting because it does require work time, which once again requires some sort of downtime. Uh, it's also very expensive. Yes, but man. What you can do I mean, makes it great. It. Well, and that's like, I mean, I think that's why it's such a good money sink because yeah. no player is ever going to complain they got to spend money to upgrade. Um, no that's... player is ever going to complain to spend money that if you get six or less non magical slashing damage, you're just resistant to it or yeah. uh, you take none of the damage instead. That's hot. No, I don't. I don't know anyone that would complain. Right. I've had players complain that they had nothing to spend their money on, but that's another topic. <laughs> well. I mean, yeah, but. Yeah. And that's why I think there's a good supplement. So the one thing I did like about this, um, so let's talk a little bit about the armor upgrades and the proofing. They come in different tiers, and they use what are called tags to reference what they do, because that means the DM can now, if they so choose, make these tags available. Like maybe you come into this uh, little tiny shanty town on the side of a mountain, and all the the gear has climbing harness tag on it which basically means you automatically in this area would make sense because the people in the area are more likely to use climbing equipment right um and so i thought little things like that are nice especially if you have the occasional blade uh or or item in a booth if you want them a little more readily available in your uh your 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 game so let's talk about some of these. There's a lot. So what I'm going to have us do is I'm going to pick a couple right away. But why don't you guys decide which armor uh, upgrade tag is your favorite? And we'll touch on that. Know. Okay, awesome. Let's hope it's not one that, uh, that that I'm about to pick. If it is, just tell me. Um, I like the muffled tag. Uh, and I think this little tag, it sounds so dumb. But who here hasn't said, oh, Paladin can't sneak. He's wearing clink, 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 clink armor. 
I would be the first paladin, the first cleric to jump on the muffled tag, which basically um, requires uh, brigandine armor, and this armor no longer confers disadvantage on dexterity stealth checks. That can make such a difference, because I've been in so many groups where the paladins attempted at stealth has just derailed our whole, you know, sneaky, which we shouldn't have been doing with a paladin to begin with, right? Uh... So that was one of the ones that I really like. Alex said she already had one, so do you want to tell us about one I of your weapon armor upgrades you like? I just wanted to say that with the muffled one, if I remember correctly, for the first, because I only watched the first uh, series for uh, Critical Role, mm -hmm. uh, they made Pike muffled weapon, like specific muffled, and she had to take a she had to take a um, attunement slot, and it was uh, silent. It was quiet armor. Mm -hmm. uh that like that just gave her a normal role instead of like disadvantage and i just i like the fact that somebody saw that that was an issue and created such an interesting and creative way to fix that issue yeah um <clears throat> my favorite is the locking joints Ooh. um first of all this is only 100 this is only 150 gold Reasonable. and you need half plate or plate armor so it's not it's not terrible because if you have half plate or plate armor you already probably have a pretty penny on you this armor is made with hinged joints that can be locked by a quick motion from the wearer. While wearing it, uh, you you make strength slash athletic checks to oppose attempts to shove you with advantage. That's awesome. Just, as a person who likes like minotaurs and you know like stuff like that, that's so fun. Cause like I would probably extend this farther and like. Because you shove prone as well. Like, I believe mm -hmm. shoving someone prone is a is a shove action as well. Yep. And so you would get advantage on going prone. I, I just, I can't even begin to describe. The only PC I've ever killed was because I shoved them prone and then mauled them on the floor. Nice. So I'm just saying I have a little bit of, like, a thing about this. Like, <laughs> so for me, one role playing like locking up your armor real fast like where like how what's what's the quick action like is it your toes like where are you going with this what's a <laughs> tail what's going on and then to go Beautiful. farther but describe this armor like try to describe your character and describe what this armor looks like you have hinges everywhere i just i just i go insane thinking of how like i think of like a dork like a really, really dorky paladin who's like <laughs> all about his god and he's super dorky. And like, everyone's like, why does he have this stupid looking armor on? And then a, <laughs> like a bear shoves him and he's like, whoop, and he just doesn't move. <laughs> Like, can you imagine? That sounds awesome. When you told me that, first thing I thought of is uh, having, like, a button or something he pushes, then all the little, like, latches and stuff just, like, and lock in place. And he's just, like, standing there. That was really cool. I like that. I love I love that one. My uh, mental image of the uh, quick action is doing a superhero pose. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> and the bear just comes up and, like, and he just doesn't move. Come at anything. me, foul beast. <laughs> Awesome, good choice. What about you, uh, Ian? This will be a weird one for me, but the burnished upgrade. It only mm -hmm. costs 10 gold, it only works for heavy armor, and on a side note, it only lasts for up to 24 hours, or till the end of combat, but basically the <laughs> armor you're wearing is polished to a fine mirror finish. And while you're wearing it, you have advantage on charisma-based skill checks while interacting with certain humanoids. Oh That's my gosh. Shiny objects. Yes. Dude, I love the idea of just like having somebody who's so like vain and into themselves that they're always like looking in their armor and like combing their hair back. Whoosh. Like, oh, don't I look fabulous. And then they get into a fight and they just start beating the crap out of the monster. Look what you did to my armor. <laughs> it's amazing. That sounds but, great. Like, what, what I, we all own cats. Am I the only one that thinks that this would work so well against a tabaxi? Because, like, my cat <laughs> loves shiny objects. Just, I'm like, sorry, chasing you around and, like, batting you, batting your, batting your pauldron. <laughs> <laughs> Me amazing. Uh, so we do have a question from John. He says, can the resistance type stacks? To my understanding, you can't stack the same proof, but you can have multiple proofs on your equipment so long as you make the pre uh, prerequisite. Like, some of them don't work together, um, and I think it 
tells you which ones don't. Like, insulated and in breathable are incompatible, and it tells you that in the prerequisites that you can't use it. But for the rest of them, you can continually stack, so you can continually improve your armor as you get more and more money. Um, and the prices do increase. We, uh, we didn't touch on it, the armor proofing first tier, but basically anybody wearing this armor takes six less damage, which I, well, maybe Alex, you might have mentioned that. Um, less non-magical slashing before resistance is applied um, if you take none of that damage instead. So, and then you go to the next tier and you can apply another one, which is 2,000 gold, then the third tier. So in order to get uh, the tiers, it just increases the resistance. So the first one's just slashing then it's slashing or piercing um and then it's uh all slashing piercing and bludgeoning damage so um and those go on top of the resistance which i think is great so uh hopefully i, I think of those questions. as like the patches that um girl scouts get you know like the little, little patches <laughs> yeah. that girl scouts get that's what i think of that's i like that that's really good um so obviously this is more than just armor, so we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, the weapons. There are several um, uh, revisions for weapons. Um, the, basically they have new properties for certain weapons. For instance, daggers and darts get the bandolier property. So when making a ranged attack with a weapon and it has the bandolier property, uh, you can immediately draw another one of the same type as part of the attack, which basically solves the issue of throwing and and running out of ammo basically which i thought was a nice touch what's that well, in the first place <laughs> yes yeah, yeah um and so they they do revise the list of weapons again giving them this the the additional uh new features included uh concealed is a really good one which That's means you ha have advantage on dexterity sleight of hand checks to keep this weapon hidden, which makes sense. It's smaller, it should be easier to hide. So little little nuances like that, I think, are done really, really well in uh, uh, Armor's Handbook. So, upgrading weapons. Once again, we obviously, our show is an hour, we can't cover every possible one, but let us each kind of pick one of our favorites and we'll, we'll talk about them. Uh, I'll pick a first tier. Alex, do you want to pick a second tier and then Ian a third? Though Ian will have less options than us. <laughs> One so, so for the first tier weapon upgrades, once again, uh, it is worth noting that once a tag is applied, it can't be removed from the weapon, um, which I think is kind of interesting. I assume that there's some balance reason for that, um, but I don't really, I don't really know because I didn't design it. So let's talk about the most obvious one, just because we should be doing this already, which is silvered. Um, I'm not going to count that as my discussion, but if you're not already going out of your way to explain how important get, go, getting silvered weapons is, you need to, because those fights with werewolves and shit are way harder if you don't either have silvered or magical weapons. So, yeah. Uh, so, not the hard way. <laughs> right. So, I want to talk about Critical Spiked, which is a first tier ability. Melee weapons that deal bludgeoning damage only. So, there is a prerequisite for that. It says prerequisite. It sounds more like a uh, like a restriction. But uh, attacks with this weapon score a critical roll uh, hit. Uh, attacks with this weapon score a critical hit on a roll one lower than normal. I love the way they word that because that means the champion who start at level three the champion fighter has a 19 to 20 means it's an 18 to 20. But everyone else, it's a 19 to 20. So it takes into account the fact that there's some features that let you increase that range already, which is really That's really nice. So good. Yeah. Yep. This part, whoever wrote this is so attentive to detail. Yeah. Actually, we can probably give a huge shout out to writing and design to Heavy Arms. Yeah. <laughs> That's the the publishing crew. So well done. Jeez. Seriously, well done. So that's one of the 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 first tier uh, items that I think is really cool. Once again, they're each you know unique in their own way, and then you can go beyond that. So now I've decided I'm going to give it critical spiked, Alex. With a base cost of a thousand gold, which is the next uh, feature we're gonna give this weapon? Yeah, so the base cost is a thousand gold, which once again I like because the whole point, of, not the whole point of this, but part of the point of this is to be a gold sink and be like, ah, oh, damn, just a little bit more gold and I can get that thing. So a yep. thousand gold, especially for what I'm about to write, say, a um, thousand gold seems very um, 
reasonable. Uh, superior, so a superior dagger, a superior greatsword, things like that. Um, you get the balanced feet, the keen feet, or the oil. You get balanced keen or oiled um, tag from above, mm -hmm. and you can only apply it uh, to weapons with one damage die. So like a flame tongue dagger that gets more uh, damage die. You won't move, you won't be able to apply it to all of that. Only one damage die. The damage die of this weapon increases by one size. So, for example, a D6 becomes a D8, a D8 becomes a D10, a D10 becomes a D12. And D12 is the max that it will go. It won't That's go to hot. D20, unfortunately. How do you describe, I mean, how on earth would you describe a dagger that does a D6 worth of damage? Like, the, the, the amazing imagery that could come from this? So I have an answer for this. Okay, I go. think taking this to a, a, a tradesmith and them reforging it out of a, not just a unique metal, but um, additional materials. So obviously there's adamantine, there's, there's all those things. But maybe when you get your dagger back, it's coated and studded with like jewels or something like that. Ooh. Where they've embedded these additional little things that just make it a little bit more deadly. Because in my mind, I was thinking uh, like the way I've seen hunters get fancy arrows that do all these different designs. But instead, it's like different jewels carved and embedded into it to make it more lethal and more dangerous. Um, like a diamond tip yes like, you know how a diamond tip slot yes like a diamond tipped dagger and that's what makes it superior oh, that's so cool. that also justifies the thousand gold sink too it also yeah it does it definitely does what about you ian there, as i'm like my pick oh no what do you think about how would you flavor the uh the superior i'd say it depends on the weapon because i kind of the explanation I came up with is kind of touched on on other items in the book, mm -hmm. but like a, like 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 it, like it being better balanced, as you're saying, better material, maybe sharpened in a way that's more efficient. Mm -hmm. There's lo lots of ways you can go about it. Yeah, I agree. Oh, that is a really good idea. Like like I could I could imagine a scenario where you bring it to a blacksmith, and the blacksmith like holds up the long the the short sword and is like, "This is not balanced to you at all. This is not weighted to you at all. Is it?" Yeah. yeah, like what? It, what is this? And he's like, what? and he's like, hold it. And then like the the, the blacksmith's like, hold this. And he like holds it. He's like, oh my god, you're not holding it right. And like the blacksmith then weights the the short sword specifically to that character, like tunes it. That's cool, Ian. That's cool. Yeah, I uh, had a fortune named cleric who was a dwarf that would, as long as quirks would criticize his enemy's weapons. <laughs> wait i love that i love that I love that, that was your that was your forge domain cleric right yeah i remember he's like That's this beautiful. is just hideous work <laughs> how could you even wield such a piece of garbage um uh, john also suggests it could be serrated my, my dm when he said does a 20 hit no you're level Actually, one yep <laughs> before i picked superior i was originally going to pick sawtooth and sawtooth yep. is serrated yeah which does 1d4 slashing extra which is nice yeah. But it doesn't affect against constructs and undead, which to me is suggesting that it's bleeding whatever it hits, which is oh, cool. Oh yeah, because I don't know if you guys have ever been cut with like a steak knife, but like you can't you can't stitch that thing up. Can't it's undo that. Weird. It's huh. not uh, fun. All right, Ian, you got the third tier with a base cost of ten thousand gold. Oh my god. <laughs> it's worth That's noting there's only two on this list. Here, and I'm going to go with arcane. Okay. The it requires the enchanted tag and can only be applied by an arcane spellcaster. You gain plus one to your spell save DCs when you use this weapon as a spellcasting focus. Yes, that's awesome. And had, yeah, and I've had to explain what that is, then you're not playing this game enough or no yes. very well. What's really but cool? Like, Warlock. Oh. Yes. Warlock. That's all I was going to say. Spell, or what is it? Pact of the Blade? Warlock? Mm -hmm. Is that, is that oh. what it's called? Oh my god. Well, that's all I was going to say. It's <laughs> worth noting, it doesn't have to go on a particular weapon right it nope. doesn't have a restriction so it can be a staff it could be a uh, a dagger what's oh. cool is you can do it more than once i bet if you could come up with the funds i was actually thinking about isaac from castlevania and his dagger just because i watched it the other week the last season so oh spoilers you should oh, really it's awesome 
<laughs> I said don't don't go into no spoilers. All right, so we're going to uh, move on here. There's lots of really cool stuff that's in this book. Obviously, we can't cover it all. Um, special ammunition, I think, is fantastic, whether it's firecracker and exploding or, or uh, uh, blunted to knock somebody unconscious. Because I don't know if you know, but when you make a ranged attack, you usually can't not not kill somebody, right? But with a melee attack, you can choose to knock them unconscious. Well, you can get, you know, blunt arrows where you can hit them with non-lethal damage, which I think is just cool as hell. I'm Im immediately thinking of old green arrow with his stupid boxing glove on the end of an arrow. <laughs> a distance punch and then laugh at the monk, say, ha ha, can you punch from 30 feet? <laughs> Because I'm petty like that. Say, though, <laughs> Berserker, the Berserker dart, by far the best. Basically, it's a poison dart that has, that puts someone in temporary psychosis, and they, they end up doing what the Berserker axe does to them um, <laughs> through a dart. And I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> like, I love it. Um, so we're going to go through that really quick. You wanted to touch on the special materials. And yes. the details, um, and you were right, the person who designed this, the heavy arms, they did a really good attention to detail, because I don't know where the hell any of this stuff comes from. <laughs> like, if anybody asks me, where's so, Mithril come from? Oh. <laughs> so, one of my favorite things is to make my players go on quests to get material components. So, like, for example, my players fought a Remoraz, and then they took the Remoraz's shell off, because it has an exoskeleton, and turned that into uh, fire-resistant armor, because the Remoraz has the warm body feature. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, whenever it comes to things like that, whenever I had to think about what would Remoraz armor do, it took me a long time, because Remoraz live in the icy mountaintops, but they have fire, they have a fire body. So ice, fire, where do I go? What do I have to, this takes all of that out. All of, it takes all of the, like, I don't want to do this. I don't want, it takes that all out for you. <laughs> and so you have uh, descriptions of where it is, uh, what it looks like, where it is, and what it would do to, uh, to armor for adamantium, cold iron, dark wood, uh, deep crystal, uh, dragon hide, ironwood, mithril, and shadow silk. And what's nice is a lot of these are like a template yes. that then help you think about, okay, well, what about basculus hide instead of dragon hide? What would that do? Right. So that's just what I wanted to say. And also on this page, they have um, broken and, and uh, damage properties, which I thought was an interesting thing that you could add in if you're doing Tomb of Annihilation or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you nailed down the head. And honestly, that's something that I wanted to design at some point. But of course, I, the list of things that I want to write and design is a, it's way too long. But uh, one of them was, you know, uh, we covered monster loot by... Um, our good friend Ann Gregerson, and she did something where some of the the loot could be used in different ways. And I've always wanted to to create an, a list of equipment effects based off of all monsters, you know. And this really gives a good template for that as well. So yes, kudos. Uh, Ian, did you have any comments on that, or can we are we ready to move on to rune smithing and stones? Move on. All right, so uh, really quick, we're going to burn through runesmithing and runestones because we're running out of time here. Um, this did It is worth knowing this came out before the rune night, um, so whatever things are similar or go against the way that's designed, that's up to you. Um, Actually, it came out before Tasha's. <laughs> yeah, right. There was play tests for the, the rune night before then, I think. Um, so mm -hmm. the ancient practice of rune magic originated with giants during the age of Austeria, ruled an area of Faerun from the Volhan Reach to the Cold Lands. Since that time, the dwarves have studied the techniques of skill, gr skilt graver, which is rune cutters, I guess, in Dwarvish. Can I just say how cool that is? Yeah. <laughs> Adapting the rune magic of giants and making it their own. So it gives you a very nice... Um, uh, structure for what rune stones are and what kind of affixes that come with them. So they do runic tagging, which is similar to what they did with the 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 armor and weapons. Um, and they give you a, an entire description of rune smithing with the tool proficiency and some things that you can do with it, um, which I think is really cool because now we're including a new tool set into the game. 
uh, which is really, really cool because it was built using the Xanathar's Guide template, which means it's it's well designed, right? Because, you know, if you're following the Wizards Coast, of course it's well designed because they don't make mistakes at all. <laughs> so, uh, what exactly is runesmithing? Ian, do you want to tell us? I, I can most definitely do that. I mean, basically, runesmithing, as the name it implies, is, well, you smith runes, which in turn gives magical properties to armor and weapons. Mm -hmm. And each any effect changes depending on what kind of rune you put on them. Yep. That's kind of what it boils down to. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but there's different, like, levels of progression. I haven't seen that with, like, other classes, because they got the runesmith guild, and it gives you <laughs> rules on, like, joining them and then how you can progress... And the, there's even a test item that you have to craft successfully to move to the next level. Like, that is so cool. Why didn't, why didn't Wizards so of the much. Coast do this with their tool sets and guilds, man? Like, come on. That is the coolest thing. I'm, I'm nerding out. Because there's, oh, there's no, combat. You absolutely should. There's combat everything. But what about the other stuff? This is the other stuff. Uh, I got to find out if Heavy Arms now has, like, a whole different set of books for the different... Uh, different sk different skills um so there's a lot to this obviously we can't cover all so why don't we each pick uh maybe one of our favorite rune stones or one that sounds really cool and we'll talk about those before we move on to the the last half of the show how's that sound absolutely um so uh one i want to pick is a rune stone called bastion uh the item is a gauntleted suit of armor or a shield. So those are the that's the item that it can be attached to. So it says while you are wearing the armor or wielding the shield, this item can use a bonus action to press your fist to the ground and speak the command word, causing a 10-foot radius immobile dome of force to spring into existence around and above you that remains stationary and lasts for one minute. The dome automatically repels non-magical ranged attacks attempting to pass through it, and the area inside the dome is considered difficult terrain for hostile creatures. Once used, this property cannot be used again until the following dawn. Oh, instant, like, energy barrier, anybody? Hell yeah! So fun. What do you guys think about that? I love it. That's 10 out of 10. That's... So useful. Yeah, that's, uh, that's hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm instantly just thinking, um, using it, you can use it to slow down enemies, you can use it to, um, funnel, uh, funnel your, um, your enemy by locking them, I imagine locking them away from uh, your allies. I, I guess I don't know if it's it can be penetrated. Uh, it says it repels non-magical attacks att or attempting to pass through it. So I don't know if that means they can walk through it or not. It says hostile creatures in the area have difficult terrain. But either way, it definitely is a, a pretty cool thing and a way to create uh, uh, a, protective bubble or <laughs> a protective bubble around your allies from creatures that are attacking from range that you can't hit. So. You know what I instantly thought of What's whenever that? you know what I you know what I just I just thought of after I mm. after I read it again, whenever Badru went down, wouldn't that have been so nice to make a little bubble around him? Hell yeah! So that the so that the uh, people couldn't so that the hobgoblins couldn't attack him and make mm -hmm. him fail death saves. Nice. See, that would have been pretty awesome. nice. Way to protect the fallen. I love it. Uh. Alex, what do you, what one of these uh, rune stones do you like? Okay, so not to make the entire podcast have a cat theme, but I picked cat. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Um, because I literally, okay, I can't tell you how many times I've had a table and they're all making their characters and in session zero, I was like, oh, no. and everyone's like, okay, I pick this, I pick this, I pick it. And then someone's like, I pick human. And we're like, oh, we all have dark vision and you don't. <laughs> That is a constant thing at my table. One person, uh, I think uh, Mordecai is the one that doesn't have dark vision for us. I think Mordecai is the only one that doesn't have dark vision. And so there's always someone that doesn't have dark vision. So Cat is, while wielding this weapon, a bonus action, uh, you can activate uh, this rune by speaking the command phrase. And then for one hour, you can see normally in darkness in a distance of 120 feet. Uh, once used, this can't be used until the following dawn. But for me, dark vision 
is so necessary because when one person in the whole game doesn't have dark vision, they almost feel like a, a burden. And like that sucks. That sucks to be that person and that sucks to be the other players and no one wants to be there. So there you go. So I'm pretty sure this is better than dark vision. Yeah, it is because uh, it's normal vision. Yes, that's that's awesome because most people don't know if it's dark and you still have dark vision, you still have the 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 detriment of um, uh, d um, dim light, which is oh. like dis disadvantage. Like that's a rule that just gets skipped over by everybody. Um, yep. Oh, I can see in the dark, so I can attack on the no. <laughs> um, but this. <laughs> It's just way better, and I love it. I think it's great. And it's uncommon, which means I can give it to everybody. <laughs> right. It's so easy to obtain, but it's, it's a quest. You you want to you wanna rune. Ooh, you want to rune. Well, now you have to go see Bob, and Bob is all crazy and stuff, and Bob can make you a cat rune, but you got to go on this cat quest. and blah, blah, blah. <gasps> You got to go rescue a cat from a yeah, Trent but... tree. <laughs> you got to go rescue his cat. <laughs> The, yeah, the, in the trees, the, the cat's in a tree that's a Trent, and it won't let it go. I love it. It's his new pet. I love it. <gasps> yes. And there we go. And now you have a cat, and now you have a rune on your on your armor I love or whatever. It. And then, I yeah. Love it. So this just solves a lot of problems yes. for me, so that's why I picked this one. Ian. My problem is there's a lot of good options. <laughs> yeah. Picking one, but I'm just going to go with, the, with uh, the Phoenix rune because it's so different. That sounds hot. See what I did there? Yep. Yeah. Ah, it's uh, rare. You attach to a suit of armor, and in a nutshell, when you are reduced to zero hit points and start dying while wearing his armor, Rune immediately casts Fireball so <laughs> on you. Oh, 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 oh shit. <laughs> and then, at the start of your next turn, instead of rolling death saves, you regain 1d6 hit points. This can, can, can only be used once until the, the following dawn, but... <laughs> You, what good does it do to bring you back to light if you kill the rest of your friends? <laughs> oh my god. And easily see this being called Kamikaze Armor too, for that matter, but you get the point. Right, yes, that is so cool. Um, that is interesting, like, if you knew the party member had this thing, you'd be like, uh, you're gonna have to stay over there. <laughs> Okay, I'm not gonna lie. I didn't get to hear it because I thought Phoenix started with an F, so I was looking for. <laughs> I was it, looking for it. It basically, um, when you you start dying, you cast Fireball on around yourself, um, oh, and okay, then it, it gives you it gives you life back. But if any of your allies are around, they're gonna take a Fireball to the face. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. This would be good for a backliner, though. Yeah. This yeah. would be really nice for a backliner. Like if you like. Start if they if they like get behind and start spamming the backliner. The backliner's like ha ha ha, fireball. <laughs> so before we close out, there's one thing that I have to talk about. Um, we talked about balance earlier. This person, this team, knew everybody is gonna say that's in balance. That's not balance. That's broken. This person put a shut the fuck up page in here that proves statistically. All their shit's balanced. And can I just say, bravo. Bravo. <laughs> like, that's amazing. Uh, so that's worth, uh, yeah, there's an appendix A for you guys. <laughs> that bitch about that's balance. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I still love how we, we still end up ch changing this, but during one of the playtests where our documents about how people complained about how one, one of the features was imbalanced. Mm -hmm. Because it was written at the time. Remember, my point was, did you do the math? Because if you do the math, it's not. Go with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing I, that... Oh, go ahead. I like how they called it weapon upgrade analysis. This appendix discussed the mathematical reasoning and other factors concerning the weapon upgrade system. And it's like, it's such a... Beautiful, Professional, polite, <laughs> fuck you. Oh. Oh. Yes. Mm, 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 mm. That's so good. Because you know you're gonna yeah, have people yeah, like that. I feel like the night for some of the time though, when people say something's unbalanced, they didn't do the math to prove it. Yeah. yeah. I've never, I've never taken the time to put the math in. Like, oh, like, oh, like, yeah, like, like the fifth edition play test, the fighters by default, all of them have maneuver die, which you got back at the beginning of your turn. 
And a lot of people will complain, that is so unbalanced! I'm like, you're calling this unbalanced when wizards have instant kill spells? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, I think that'll do it for our main topic today, the Complete Armorer's Handbook. Um, what a cool supplement. Uh, if this sounds like something you want to check out, please uh, head on over to CritAcademy.com and f check it out in our show notes. We do have an affiliate link there. So not only do we know that we sent you there, but also uh, we do get a small uh, kickback from it. So you help us, you help them, and you help yourselves. We all win. <laughs> Um, I, say, I just got to say, this is probably the most put together and detailed oriented uh, supplement I've ever reviewed with you guys. It is <laughs> it, it is amazing. Like I would I'm I would be shocked if this person had a team of less than 10 people. Yeah. Yes. Uh, they, they might. I closed my PowerPoint, I think. But um, I think the it was less than 10 people, actually. Uh, yeah. So if I'm looking at mechanical uh, uh, writing and design, um, there is just one person's name under. Oh, there's there's it just says heavy arms. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, okay. You're right. I was like, if that's person one person, geez. Yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> one person's name for mechanical editing. So, yeah. But design is under heavy arms. Anyways. So, yeah, it's probably definitely a good team. It's a very nice put together yeah. product. Uh, definitely one of the better ones that I've seen. Um, so that'll do it for our main topic today. Uh, the Complete Armorer's Guide, or the Complete Armorer's Handbook. Uh, so definitely consider checking that out. Like I said, I think it's fantastic. Um, before we move on to our honor tips and tricks, uh, I would like to just let everyone know that this weekend... On May 29th and 30th is well, May 28th, 29th, and 30th is Dungeon Con. That is, ho yeah, Dungeon Con, which is hosted by Goodman Games, Cobalt Press, and DMs Guild. Uh, we ourselves are going to be there. Um, we will have a show at the same time, same place here, but it'll also be taking place inside of the convention. Um, so make sure you come and check that out. Come visit us. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm running a couple games. One is Capes and Crooks and another one is a, uh, D and D module. So you can sign up if that's something you're interested in. Um, and they're giving away some really cool fat loots. And I'm not just saying that because I gave one away, one of my best products to anybody that gets a badge. So, um, there's some good stuff going to be out there. That's going to be at the giveaway. So definitely consider, uh, checking it out. All right. And head on over to, is it just Dungeon Con? Yep. I think. I'm hoping to run the Gamer too, but we got some logistics to figure out. Yeah, I know you've been running into some issues. But yeah, definitely check that out. Uh, all right, let us transition into our Unearth Tips and Tricks. And now, what you've all been waiting for. Our Unearth Tips and Tricks segment where we bring you new and reusable material for both players and DMs. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget the slides. Ah, uh, yeah, I do forget that sometimes. Oh, that's the wrong one. There's the website. <laughs> All the new features. <laughs> So let me put that over there. And all right, our Unearth Tips and Tricks segment. Alex, would you like to tell us about our uh, character concept? Now, it is worth noting that we took a different approach with this compared to what we normally do. So please Ooh, like this. let me know what you think. Um, it's a different format, different everything. So we're going to do this a couple times so I can get some feedback or we'll go back to the old way. Hit it. Um, Avelina Adiron? Is that how you say your name? I have no idea. That's a randomly generated name. <laughs> really, it's yes. beautiful. I know. It's so beautiful. <laughs> a moderately attractive woman, she wears an old set of leather armor, nicked and torn by the ravages of time and battle. Her silver hair is lengthy and is close to two feet long. Her, her otherwise smooth face is marked with small, tiny scars. Um, love her. Uh, also love the idea of her being silver. Uh, the one thing that I would ask is like, what, uh, what race is she? 
Because I think Shit. Elf immediately. <laughs> I don't know if there's one on there. Any one you want. Yes. Elf. Um, personality. <laughs> she runs her personal life as if detached from it. She organizes uh, appointments and outings based on perceived benefits she will get from it. She is ruthless. If she is a ruthless businesswoman, a trait she acquired from her mother. So neutral, true neutral. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, she was born to loving parents in a slum to the east. When money was particularly tight, she was walking through alleys when she overheard a shepherd hiring some criminals to sabotage a competitor. She made her way to the other competitor and par. Uh, Parlayed. Parlayed, thank you. Parlayed her knowledge into a job. She has been a successful dealer of antiques, buying low and selling high. Um, her motivation? Balancing her hectic life and new shepherd responsibilities is difficult. Her ideal is an entrepreneur. Her flaw is that she is selfish. Her bonds is that she's attractive and poor, so she feels for the poor. And her occupation is a shepherd i'm guessing that's a shepherd with a uh with quotation marks around it because she's sabotaging ah um, nice and her uh voice is loud with vibrato um all right i really really love her the if the first thing that i instantly think of is like an aloof person that the Pete, that the characters might see as like competition. So one of my favorite things to do in a game is to make another set of adventurers in the same local area who are getting to things before the players are. You know, like Red in yep. Pokemon. Yes. Like that. That bastard. Uh, people might not. People people might be too <laughs> young to know what Red is. The the rival in Pokemon. How they always like get there before you and defeat. Yeah, that's what that's what uh, Evelina makes me think of. Is I agree the, with uh, that. Is your rival. That's a good assessment. I love it. But then I would really like the idea of at the very very end, she either joins the bad, the big bad, and you have to kill her too, or she gets scared and you have to save her. <laughs> One or the other. Your pick. I love it. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think this is a really just interesting character concept overall. Um, definitely it's fleshed out more like an NPC, but this totally can be a player character build. It gives you everything you need yeah. to flesh out your player character. So, um, like I said, a little different uh, format, but uh, I like it. It's a little more um, professional. So when it's inside of our ma monthly magazine, our honor tips and tricks, like it comes out once a month. You can pick it up at our website at careeracademy.com or patrons at t $10 tier or higher get it free. So, sorry for the plug there, but yeah, that's why I, <laughs> that's why it's all reformatted in a new way. Uh, do you have anything I to... I actually personally really like it. I like it formatted like this, mm -hmm. especially because it is... For me, whenever I learn about the history, whenever I learn about the shepherd occupation, it just forms a more full picture with more mm -hmm. vivid colors. Right. I like and that. And I, I really enjoy that. Very cool. Ian, do you have anything to add? I am just uh, given the fact that this character does like what has a wasn't it for me mentality. <laughs> I'm just picturing you, you get into a fight and, the, and they're on the other side. Help us. Why? Pair you. With what? Money. Done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. All right, that'll do it for our character concept, Avelina Aturton. Aturtion? Aturton? Ah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> our monster variant of the day is our Briar Thorn Goblin. So, in order to build this bad boy, you're going to start with the stat block of the Coatl. Uh, which is an awesome creature, by the way. If you don't use it in your games, you need to. Um, we're going to lose a couple features. First, we're going to drop entirely the spell list. We're going to get rid of the chain shape, the fly, shield in mind, true sight, telepathy, and the bite ability. Right here for some numbers. <laughs> so what are we going to give it? So I said we got rid of the spell list. We're giving it a new spell list to fit the Briar Thorn Goblin feel, uh, which is... Uh, uh, a goblin that's actually uh, plant-based, where the plant actually 
uh, the Fey Wild opened up around a sacrificial area of goblins and brought the Briar Briar Thorn together a life, and it kind of just built and formed around the goblin bones. Uh, which I just think is really cool. So the new spells would be At Will, Dancing Lights, Druid Craft, and Pass Without a Trace. These little bastards, hard to find. They don't want you to. Uh, three times a day, they can do Entangle and Fog Cloud. And once a day, they can Counter Spell. Ha <laughs> ha! Now these are going to be some annoying little yeah. ass goblins. Uh, dispel oh, Magic, <laughs> Spike Growth, and Wall of Thorns, man. These things are nothing but terrible problems. To top that off, we're going to give it Nimble Escape, which basically lets it disappear engage or hide as a bonus action they also have pass without a trace so you're going to be harassed by these things and most of the time you're not even going to know it then we're going to give it the claw feature which i think is really fun not only does it give a plus eight to hit but it does 1d6 plus five piercing damage and the target must exceed a dc 14 con save or be poisoned for 25 hours now that doesn't sound really bad except until the poison ends the target is unconscious shit that sucks another creature can use an action to shake the target awake these little bastards <laughs> are gonna run around terrorizing players uh and stealing from them and Knocking them out and dragging them off to be devoured or or become plant food, <laughs> which I just think is great. I what do you guys adore think? Adore them. And just for clarification, I assume you're not talking about the poison condition at any point either. So, no. Um. Uh. Yeah. Well, no. The, the uh. They are poisoned. They become poisoned. Yeah. So it's the poison condition. And while they're poisoned, they're also unconscious. So yeah. but yes, it is poisoned because it says saving throw or be poisoned. Yeah, that's right. Okay. For 24 hours, and that's a long time. That right. is a long time. Imagine what you uh, uh, an enemy can do with the players if they've got 24 hours to plan. Oh, I'm just thinking about, like, the hobgoblins that you guys just yeah. fought. If yeah. I had done Briarwood goblins and put him down in the rice paddy, he oh, would have been underwater. No. That would have been terrible for us. Yeah. Well, how deep was the briar? Was it at our waist? Because these are small creatures. Oh, okay. So, yeah, the Briarwoods wouldn't be able to, like, um, the Briarwoods would be able to get into the, well, the water, I think the water was, like, ankle high at the time. Oh, then, yeah, they've been fine. Why. Yeah, they've been fine. They're not tiny. They're just small. But, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. this is, this is definitely, uh, oh, I forgot. It's got another power. I totally forgot about this. Thorny Grapple. When a creature within five feet hits the goblin with an attack, the Briarthorn Goblin can use its reaction to attempt to grapple the attacker. I must be in a grappling mood, right, Alex? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Brian, the Briar Thorns uh, Goblin's thorny limbs help it to grapple a creature up to medium size, granting advantage on the check. A grappled creature takes 2d4 piercing damage at the end of the Briar Thorns turn for as long as it remains grappled. So a lot of fun. Um, definitely a troublemaker, which is kind of what I was going with, but I wanted a more magical as troublemaker. So you, we got the awesome Briar Thorn Goblin. So uh, if you are a patron, these get fully fleshed out with backstory and um, little bits of lore that you can feed directly to your players. So um, definitely consider checking that out or picking up the UTT that they come out in. So uh, any other uh, comments or questions on this bad boy? Nope. Okay. Oh. Awesome. Ian, would you like to tell us about our encounter of the podcast? Our encounter of the podcast comes from as net network on reddit up from the rich give to the fallen <laughs> let's be honest in adventure is life you're bound to be robbed more than once as you climb through the ranks of your guild or get more powerful it has hardly become a challenge anymore and most are just an old posse of generic humans waiting to be put down <laughs> the ground would be catching my meeting <laughs> it's such a wide wild world doesn't need to be. It'd be great to be that one DM that adds a memorable encounter and a, another group of Avengers, just as varied in classes and races as your party is. It turns out that one of their party members died during their own adventures, and there was their only member capable of casting revive spells. That's unfortunate. They <laughs> have found someone who can do it for them, but are being uh, charged an exorbitant price for the service. Not to mention, they need to get the spell composed themselves. That could take a while. The DM can play very intelligently here, but should give the attacking bandits an air of desperation. 
will be quick to retreat if another member is low. But the crowd's like, we can't lose another! And we just take their healer hostage. Oh, damn, this is mean! This is so mean! Like, what are they going to do? <laughs> what do you think about this, uh, Alex? Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to hear it because my computer overheated. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. So, I'm going to tell you what I think. The idea of a group of adventurers that are so tormented that they want to they want to save their friends so bad that they're willing to rob, threaten, and steal from other adventurers but not out of malice, makes for an absolutely amazing encounter. I think it's just, they're putting their lives on the line and willing to potentially take other lives, or maybe they don't take the lives. Maybe they, you know, they, they poison the group and just steal from them or whatever. But in either case, you put two good groups together, but one is so desperate, they're forced to do something that would otherwise be considered wrong, unethical, and even maybe, you know, a little dark. Um, but I mean, that just shows that when it comes to adventuring parties, they're willing to do some pretty crazy stuff to protect their, their friends. Um, and I just think it's fantastic. Uh, yeah. do, do you have any thoughts on that, Ian? I definitely believe it as an interesting dynamic from the standpoint of most bandits. Yeah. As I said, they're, you'll just give them a second thought, but, and I kind of as a DM like the idea of building a new a party and running them as NPCs using oh the, uh, god that's awesome character options. that sounds fun I like it uh, alright that'll do it for our encounter of the podcast uh, Rob from the Rich give to the fallen from Nez Network on Reddit um, nice. our n magic item would you like to tell us about that there uh, Alex yeah, so uh, I love this. It's a cobalt <laughs> mystery meat kebab. This common cobalt treat is a mixture of pretty much whatever meat they can find, uh, adding a bit of crust, simple her. herbs, and then tossing it in a tossing it on a thin branch. Do you hear her? Uh, what? Keep going. He can't hear you, but I can. Keep going. Oh. Uh, uh, they make for a better meal than tr trail rations, but not by much <laughs> so this is a collection of mismatched cubed meat and then it's tossed on a stick for a go-to of every cobalt the mixture uh the mix of preparation the mix of i don't know what i'm reading is i'm so i'm very dyslexic i'm it's very okay sorry. you got it you're doing um, fine seasoning and well whatever else they can find put it on a warm fire and put something warm in your belly uh, there is enough on the kebab for one use, and when you spend one minute eating the kebab, you gain uh, advantage on wisdom, perception checks, while in dim or dark light. This effect lasts up for one hour, and this effect ends if you become unconscious uh, or become affected by a spell such as dispel magic or similar. Uh, this uh, will, will end the magic effect. Now, what I like to believe is that that I really like about this is because I'm very Italian. I grew up Italian and stuff. And so for us, uh, every single Italian family has a special seasoning like mixture that they do. And you're not supposed to tell the other families what your mixture of seasonings are. You're just like, whenever you make a meatball, whenever you make meatballs, you have like a specific ingredient ra ra ratio. Everyone has the same ingredients, but like ingredient ratios. And I like to imagine that Somewhere, somehow, in the seasonings and in the ratio of the kobolds, a magic mushroom or, like, some kind of powder got mixed in. And, like, they're like, wow, this tastes so good. But really, it's, like, straight up magic. I, that's what I like to imagine. <laughs> I love it. Um, right. Refreshing Discord team to help. So. All right. Um, so what's cool about this is how I mentioned earlier, you mentioned the cat and how it – Grants better than dark vision because dark vision in a battle situation still is dim light, which is still disadvantage. This explains why maybe they won't suffer those penalties sometimes, um, which I think is really cool. The other thing is I'm slowly putting together a, um, a mix of consumables, specifically chef foods and, um, um, magic potions and stuff because I really want to make a, a, a really cool little consumable product. But um, this was definitely something I like. I like the idea of it's common. The benefit is very minor. 
Um, in fact, this is only the second common item I think I've had on the show. Um, and mm. what's cool is that it can be given out to the, the players at like special like events or, or um, it could be a special offering to the uh, adventurers as they're going out on a, 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 well, an adventure. Maybe it's dark out and people know that it makes your site better. Turns out the secret's just carrots. Who knows? Uh, but it's something carrots. simple and to the point. Because <laughs> it's on a kebab. That's funny. That was a happy accident. I like it. <laughs> um, overall, pretty simple, but it's still got kind of a little bit of magical magic in it. Um, did you have anything to add, Ian? Um, no, I thought this was a pretty good one, and we don't really see anything based off of food too often, so. Yep. Well, hopefully. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for your uh, cookbook, because I yeah. know why you're making it, and I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, that'll do it for our magic item, the Cold Ball Mystery Meat Kebab. Ian, would you like to tell us about our uh, Dungeon Master tip? I can do that. Our DM tip for the day is make it believable. I know, kind of a rhythm. Believe it! RPG, right? <laughs> Believability is simply a matter of staying true to your material and to the fiction of D&D or your own homebrewed world. Everyone has already bought off on the expansion of disbelief needed to imagine a world in the first place of medieval weapons and armor, magic, and monsters, which I think some people need to remember sometimes. Uh, <coughs> you just need to help sell it by making the fiction seem real. Use evocative descriptions that key off all of the senses of the players. How something sounds. What does it look like? What does it smell like? What it feels like? Use names that sound real and fit the fiction of our world. Bob the Slayer is kind of goofy and will lead to goofy play. Victor the Vile sounds like a believable person in the D&D world. Keep it believable and the action of the games will reach a whole nother level. Yeah. This is pretty straightforward. I definitely, I definitely agree with this. And, like, one of the things that I also notice is that, like, you do need moments. Okay, so one of the things that I just, like, would love to bounce off of, like, this is with the names is that you need moments in a game where people can goof off. You need te tension and release, but you need the release, right? And so I have a I have an NPC. Her name is Flower, and she is a bugbear who was found abandoned uh, by some humans and raised her to be human. And she's not very good at it, but she tries her best. Um, and she is very funny to awkward she's very awkward and she's very funny and she tries very hard to not be scary so she wears like sundresses and big bows on her head because her father told her who could hate a pretty girl with a bow on her head who could be scared <laughs> of a pretty girl with a bow on her head yeah when flower comes out it signals to the other players that it's time to relax I like that. So that's another really good, like not only like making things believable, not only making things believable and, you know, using descriptors whenever appropriate in a serious sense, but also in a, hey, if you want to goof off right now, it's cool. Now's the time. I love that. That is fantastic. And, and my comment with Bob the Slayer at the very least is, for all we know, Bob was a farmer, but then he fell into the adventuring life. <laughs> <laughs> happy, happy accident. <laughs> and it's not like, well, well, it'll be real here. It's not like uh, parents expect their children to necessarily be adventurous per se, so they just give them generic names. And also on the same note, you can turn Bob into Robert. So That's true. Roberto the Bod. I am Bob the Slayer. That sounds lame. Look, my name's Bob, okay? My, my parents made me this. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do anything about it. <laughs> Uh, awesome. All right, that'll do it for our Dungeon Master tip. Make it believable. Our player tip of the podcast is... Don't be, don't a, be dick. a dick. Don't be a dick. Well, that wasn't even close. Okay. <laughs> it was a good to effort, honest, team. I forgot. <laughs> it's a, I forgot. It's a good effort. Uh, and our tip today is infinite copies of yourself. Holy crap, sil simulacrum plus wish spell. Level 17 wizard is required. You cast Simulacrum on yourself. You have half your hit points and you can't regain spell slots. You have no gear. You're completely stark ass naked. But that's okay. Basically what that means is you now have a duplicate of yourself. And it lasts until you cast the spell again. 
right? Which then it just undoes it. But we're going to take a route around that. Instead, you're going to then take a long rest after you cast the spell. And then you're going to have the clone cast wish on you to cast a new 7th level simulacrum on you. Now that you have all of your spell slots, this new clone of you can now cast simulacrum itself. Then you rinse and repeat and watch your dungeon master cry. Or all of the simulacrums start fighting each other. Make sure you do this in a mountainous area because you're going to need a lot of snow. Okay? Yeah. Or mud or dirt or something like that. Um, it is worth noting that to cast it the first time, you do need a 15,000 gold or 15,000 gold worth of like powdered rubies or diamonds or some shit. But outside of that, functions as intended. I couldn't. I looked at this numerous times. I couldn't find anything wrong with it. Um, what do you guys think about that? Go, so my, my army of me's. I go, my army of me's. <laughs> I love it. Um, so something that I don't know. Now I'm wondering because you said you looked and like couldn't see anything wrong with it. Doesn't mean I didn't there, miss anything. I thought that whenever you cast Wish, there's a 30% chance that you will never be able to cast Wish again. Uh, let's double check that. I think that there is truth to that. But it's small. I think it's smaller chance than that, though, isn't it? So when you look at it, it says. Um, I can't remember. Ah, the stress of casting the spell to produce any effect other than duplicating another spell weakens you. Other than duplicating another spell weakens you. Oh my god, I hate it. After hate enduring it. the stress, each time you cast the spell until you finish a long rest. You take 10 necrotic or 1d10 necrotic damage per the spell level. This damage can't be reduced or prevented in any way. In addition, your strength drops down, blah, blah, blah. Um, but even if it disappears, it's disappearing from the simulacrum, not from you. I hate it. Oh my god, this is amazing. This is, it does. I, okay, Th I, so this is one of those moments where I would be so proud of my... I'd be, I'd hate my player, but I'd be so proud of my player. And I'd just be like, a dragon comes. Don't, dragons don't exist in my world, but a dragon comes now, and them all. You are right. The very last line does say, finally, there is a 33% chance you are unable to cast Wish ever again if you suffer this stress. But that's if you suffer that stress. So, anyways, oh, okay. it doesn't matter because the simulacrums are casting it, not you. Oh, and therein man. lies the, it's, it's effing crazy. Um, in the locker room, wish, cast wish I can cast wish again. This is one of those moments where people are like, whenever people look at, like, I know so many people who are like, I don't use homebrew, I don't use any homebrew material, even if it's published, because there's no way it's balanced. I'm like, you think Wizards of the Coast is balanced? Right, they make mistakes. Yeah. You think it's all balanced? <laughs> I and wish they didn't, but... Here and there with yeah. how they've done things, but that's going to be true for any published RPG. Right, right, and there's always that risk. But raw-wise, um... <laughs> John says, Dormammu, I've come to bargain. <laughs> I love it. So uh, the only thing I think would be really cool about this is the simulacrum only obeys the person that created it. So there's this long, uh, the, you ever in school do the telephone thing where you say one thing into one ear and by the time it gets back, like, can you imagine the instructions by the time they got back to the person that's supposed to do it? They wouldn't be remotely the same. Uh, and that is how you monkey paw that. That, yes. that is how you take that and shove it back in the player's face. Yes. Um, yes. And it does point out that the, uh, the simulacrum obeys the caster and that's it. So they can. St I imagine you can have some sort of disagreement at some point. But, anyways, I thought this was awesome. I totally found this on TikTok, and it blew me away to the point that I had to go and spend time reading. So, and let's be real here too. If your players can do it, <laughs> dude. Somebody told me there's a character in Forgotten Realms that did something like this, like Monchoon or something, where he ended up just like. Oh. Uh, destroying himself or like a highlander type thing happened i guess oh. i don't i don't know i didn't google it but it sounded no, I really interesting talking about so, i know what you're talking about but i don't remember what it is yeah so apparently this has happened in forgotten realm setting so uh lore wise so all right that'll do it for our player tip of the podcast don't, don't be, be a dick don't be a dick that was much better uh, and you can avoid dickitude by making infinite copies of yourself <laughs> no that makes you a dick it does. <laughs> Just kidding. No, it makes you. It makes you smart. But then I'm gonna monkey paw you and yeah. make them all. I think that's you. hilarious. 
Uh, that's, see, that's one of those things I feel like we should make let work for like a couple days and then watch yeah. as they're trying to build their army to take over the world and then it becomes some Highlander level shit. There can only be one! I'm yeah, actually picturing Mr. Meeseeks from Rick and Morty. Oh, yeah? Because oh, <laughs> those guys get more and more stable, unstable the longer they're alive. <laughs> That's such an interesting idea. If they just yes. get more and more, like, they start melting a little bit because they're made of snow. They start, like, one of their fingers just, like, bloop, just plops off and I'm it's snow. i for two days. We're not supposed to live this long. <laughs> Let me yeah. die. That oh my so gosh. Funny. All right. Uh, so before we close out today, we have another gift to give away. Compliments of, I forgot who this was. Sorry, dude. What is our product we're giving away there, Ian? A psychomancer. A psychomancer. Looks like a the tournament. Oh, never mind. Maybe I'm in the wrong spot. Oh. A psychomancer is a wizard adept in the manipulation of the psyche, or as commonly known, a soul. Be it for good or ill. It all depends on the caster's heart and grit, as well as their general tendencies and view of the world. Not many practitioners have lived to tell the tale, but those who have speak of a hard and gruesome path, which eventually may, may even lead to godhood. <laughs> yes, it is from DM Enclave. Conclave. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so who's our winner today? Our winner today is Carby's Master. Yes. Congratulations. Woo! All right. Didn't it win? Not a problem. Head on over to crackhemi.com and subscribe for your chance to win. Yes. Do that. Do it. No. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Um, before we close and out. Go ahead. Actually, before we close out, I do want to uh, pour it out for Kentaro. Who? Miruha. I can't pronounce his last name to save my life. Oh, he yeah. was the author for Berserk, and he passed away. <laughs> That's, yeah, that sucks. And if any of you read, read, read Berserk, both people don't even realize how influential this work has been on dark fantasy in general. <laughs> so, yep. Well, even on if, regular, like Final Fantasy VII, you think uh, Cloud would have a buster sword if Guts didn't have it first? No. <laughs> in fact, like during Castlevania Season 4, one vampire had day armor, if you will. And the showrunner said, yep, we straight up ripped off uh, Guts' Berserker armor. And they showed pictures next to each other. Yeah, same design, same poses. You gotta get your inspiration from somewhere, as long as you oh, yeah. do not copy. Right? <laughs> I'm just curious if the series will be finished at this point, because it was incomplete, but we'll hey, see. Anyways, um, before yeah. we close out, uh, do you want to give yourself one more plug, Alex, in the show? My name is Alex Baum, spelled A-E-L-X-B-O-M-B, -E because I'm dyslexic. Um, and I do Twitch, uh, where we noodle out and round with Dungeons and Dragons. And then I do TikTok, where I talk about um, things, DMs and DMing and sort. And uh, I also run a show that Justin is on um, called Initiative and Intrigues. Yeah. Yes. You should come join us. Enjoy some stew. Brick make you stew. It tastes really good. He just got some good new meat in, too. Apparently, we're making Brick uh, custom recipes, so that's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's awesome. Uh, all right, so uh, please join us on our next episode. We will be hosting our show through the amazing Dungeon Con Online event hosted by Goodman Games, Cobalt Press, and DMs Guild, as mentioned earlier. We will be discussing... Planes walking with the MTG or Magic the Gathering, planes of existence for your heroes to venture into. Most people don't know this, but Wizards of the Coast has released its several short, you know, 15 page documents that, in, uh, I think they're even more than that actually, that give you details about those worlds and how to change some of the current character types to fit that theme. And I'm super excited to talk about that. Um, if you're interested in checking out and visiting us at Dungeon Con, you can head on over to rebrand.ly slash Dungeon Con um, and sign up. Come check us out. It's going to be a lot of fun, I promise. Um, maybe even come and join me for a game of Capes and Crooks or D&D. &D. Yeah. Uh, if you enjoy the show and you'd like to support us, please give us a visit at CritAcademy.com. Follow us on social media and leave us a review. Keep an eye out. We just shipped all of our memorable monsters books to our adorable and awesome backers. 
So once they all receive their copies, those will be going on sale soon. So keep an eye out for that as well. I know I'll be uh, super excited for that. I am your host, Justin. Like, I don't know who's next. <laughs> I'm your host, Dan. Thanks for listening. Keep your blades sharp and spells prepared, heroes. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us today. Goodbye.